Welcome everyone. I'm Jeffrey Goodman, Director of Marketing and Development for the YMCA of Northwest Louisiana, and we're here for Shreveport Bossier, my city, my community, my home. My guest today is Brittany Dunn, and I just recently met you in person. We've spoken on the phone a couple times, but I just recently met you in person, I believe last week uh, at a meeting that we were both in attendance at, which uh, we're going to get to because I want to ask you about that. Okay. So okay. thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, your name has come up in a couple of, of these previous episodes, so I'm excited. To, really? Yeah, people have said, well, you need to talk to Brittany. So. Okay, okay, interesting. Well, here we are. All right, well, here we are. Yeah. I will hop in. Um, well, Brittany, uh, my first couple of questions in terms of the questions are super long because I just want to give some background on you, but okay. hang in there with me. Um, you run your own accounting business, B&D Tax and Accounting Services, LLC. Is that right? Well, I changed the name. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I changed the name um, in 2021 to Brittany Dunn CPA, LLC. Okay, yes. perfect. And feel free on, on anything just to make sure I get it right. You're greatly involved in our community. Let me, let me name some of the high points. Okay. You serve on the following boards. Caddo Council on Aging. Uh, previously. Okay. Mm -hmm. Volunteers of America. Yes, currently. United Way of Northwest yes. Louisiana. You were recently appointed to the Democratic Parish Executive Committee for District 10. Yes, I've been about three years now. Okay. And you currently serve as a chairwoman of the Shreveport African American Chamber of Commerce. Yes, that's correct. Perfect. You once said, this is a quote I pulled um, on you, you once said, try not to become a person of success, rather a person of value. Absolutely. So my first question for you is, why do you care so much about being a value to our community? Um, I would say, you know, um, just in the different, uh, throughout my career, um, I really didn't know uh, at a young age what I wanted to do, right? Um, when I graduated college and I became an accountant, I looked all over Shreveport for, I'm going to be honest, uh, a mentor. I wanted an African-American mentor that was in accounting, which is some, someone that you, you know, you don't see too many of. You don't see too many black CPAs and things like that. Um, and so, you know, I searched, then I went and started looking for just other professionals that look like me, you know, and um, it wasn't a lot of people out there that was willing to give time and effort and to help reach back and pull the next person up. And so, you know, I, uh, so then I realized I need to create that path for other people, you know? So didn't have a mentor for probably about, I don't know, maybe 10 years of my life when I was looking for one. Um, and so I just worked hard as I could, you know, in the community to build myself up, you know, had experiences, learned different things so I can be able to pass those things down. And so, you know, I just feel like uh, in Shreveport in order for us to get, you know, we had a, I feel like we had an age gap there, right? So you have me coming up at probably like 24, 25 looking for a mentor. You have people that are like 50 years old that I was calling on, you know, and they have different things going on with their life now. And we needed some people in that age range of 30, 35, you know, 40 that was successful that I can look to and I couldn't find anybody. And so I tried to work hard to be that person for our community. You know, I want people to know that, you know, when you see African-American women and professionals, you know, you don't have to uh, look online and see people making money this way or you don't have to uh, fall into some of the uh, issues that African-American can fall into you know you can actually see people who work hard that that grind that invest their time um, in the community and you can say hey that's what I want to be you know even with my nieces and nephews I I work hard so that they can see hey you know my aunt she's actually changing Shreveport or trying to change Shreveport you know and so uh, every decision that I make in my life I try to make a decision that wouldn't cause anybody else to look 
and me any different. You know, if, if I am what they are aspiring to be at some point, I don't want to make a decision that will cause them to get off track. And do you feel like, I mean, you're definitely a mentor for a lot of people and definitely an inspiration for a lot of people. Do you feel like we're starting to fill that gap uh, in our community? I still feel like we have work to do. You know, um, I do feel like it has been a lot of people that I'm surrounded by that are trying to do that same thing. But I think that sometimes we can get still get so caught up in our personal lives to where time may be an issue you know um, I know this last year I had a baby so I hadn't been able to devote that much time as I would love to into the community you know prior uh, than I was previously but I think that um, you know we still have to maintain all of the community involvement that we have you know run businesses you know and then as women we have kids that's a whole different thing that we don't discuss you know i know people always ask me all the time how do you do it and sometimes i really don't know um but i feel like we are attempting to fill that gap uh but i think that if we create more mentorship programs and make ourselves you know figure out how we can have more time and and uh designate that time then I think that that will work better as well and that's some of the main focus right of the african-american chamber in town is is to kind of lift up the african-american businesses provide more opportunities to the african-american community yes so we have a lot of first generation business owners right as african-americans you know people that has a has a dream has a goal um, have an idea but didn't have mentorship, may not have resources and things like that. So, you know, when you deal with um, um, sometimes, I'm trying to think of how I want to say this, but, you know, you have business owners that uh, are third generation business owners because it's been passed from the 50s to the 70s and things like that, right? And so, people have grown up and watched their grandfathers run businesses and some of us didn't have that opportunity, right? So when you're a first generation business owner, your struggles may be different. You didn't have a mentor, you didn't sit at home and, you know, or go to the office with granddad or dad and watch them run a a company as a CEO. And so we're a little bit behind there. And so we realize that our business owners have different struggles, you know, because they have not had mentorship and they don't have experience. Um, And they struggle in areas with lack of capital and things like that and lack of resources. So because we realize that our goal is to try to educate, you know, government officials, people at the state level, people at the city level, and say, hey, we have a unique group of people. And it may just not be uh, African Americans. It could be any minority group that doesn't have, you know, uh, multiple, uh, we can't say that we have 40, 50, 60, third generation business. I mean, I sat down and thought about just in Shreveport, how many business owners we can say uh, African American that has three generations, and I can only think of Orlando's, you know, uh, and that's good that we have one, but I can't think of too many more companies that we can say uh, actually trained up the next generation, and so we are trying to be a support and and provide resource and advocate on their behalf and say, hey, these business owners that are first generation business owners, most of them are minorities, and they do need help. Love it. Okay. Um... This is another long question. In a in a historic partnership, the Shreveport Bossier Convention Tourist Bureau, together with the City of Shreveport, the City of Bossier City, the Greater Shreveport Chamber of Commerce, the Bossier Chamber of Commerce, the Shreveport Bossier African American Chamber of Commerce, and other local community organizations are working together to develop a destination master plan and community brand. While the Convention and Tourist Bureau has led the project and is funding the initiative, a steering committee with representatives from around the area has been organized to offer guidance and assistance. You are steering committee Mm co-chair along with Lisa Johnson, President and CEO of the Bossier Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the importance of this project and where we are so far in the process. Okay, um, actually, they're doing a reveal today, um, and it's at the same time, what was it, 1030, um, to where they can actually show what uh, the brand, you know, what we think the brand is going to consist of, so I'm going to have to catch up on that, but um, 
Of course, we know that Shreveport has its own set of issues, right? And so the goal of this is to try to figure out what does the citizens of Shreveport feel like is our brand? You know, what could make us feel like we have that community pride that we need? What do we value from Shreveport? And so, um, you know, when I sit down and, and was thinking, you know, uh, some of the reasons that people say that they're in Shreveport, because it's a, you know, it's a large city, but it's also small enough for you to raise a family, you know, things like that, uh, faith-based. And, and um, you know, I, I had one guy give an example of five Fs, and it's in my phone over there, but it was, it was amazing. I was like, this is exactly what Shreveport is. But sometimes we forget, um, you know, what's important to us, and we forget to have community pride because of so many things that are going on around us. And so it's important for us to focus on that so that we can rebrand and try to get our citizens to buy into that brand, right? Um, and at the same time, it's important for us to be able to bring people here and, and for them to experience Shreveport and, you know, love it and want to come back. You know, when you go to New Orleans, you see all kind of people dancing on the street. You know, it may be a CEO, it may be someone that's sitting on the side of the roads that's beating the drums. And the culture is so blended to where economic status and things like that isn't important at that time. People are just enjoying themselves and having a good time, you know. And I think that with Shreveport, with the issues that we have, you know, if we if we can create our own culture and build on that culture, then it can definitely help change Shreveport. And I will say I was in a room with you. That's when we officially met in person mm -hmm. last week, and I, I thought it was an impressive group um, yes. you guys had brought together to help create this plan to help create this brand and mm -hmm. um, you know I, I've said a number of times on this podcast I feel like you know we have one thing that bothers me is I feel like we have three four five different cities all existing here doing their own thing that rarely do things together mm -hmm. um, and you know hopefully you know part of what we're moving toward moving forward is a, a way to harness that energy Absolutely. yeah the, you know some of the things that was brought up was the fact that you know Bozier is operating their own on their own and Shreveport is operating on their own you know and trying to blend that together so that we can be considered as one and we can feel as one you know uh also, you know, developing additional festivals. We talked to faith-based leaders. We talked to people like uh, Matt Snyder and Sylvester Marshall that does festivals for one for the African American community, one for um, the Caucasian community. You know, what about us doing joint festivals together? You know, um, we talked to young entrepreneurs. We talked to African American entrepreneurs. We talked to it was probably 43, 40 something focus groups. You know, a lot of different one-on-ones just so that we can get everyone's perspective also we had uh three town hall meetings as well and they were very good because you know you would think like i think that this is something that somebody said last week you would think that the people since we hear so many complaints about shreveport and uh we, you would think that negative energy would come in but it was positive it was very good feedback people showed up and gave their opinion and you know we felt like people still believe in this city and, and that's a good thing absolutely mm -hmm. so it's it's inspiring to see someone like you working so hard to give back to our community in in your opinion how do we create more people like you that believe in shreveport bozier um, <laughs> you know like i said mentorship I can honestly say that um, I, I have now, you know, in the last two or three years, I have uh, two mentors and they... Can you talk about who they are? Yeah, uh, Jonathan Reynolds and uh, Darren Dixon. And you'd think that I would have a woman mentor, but <laughs> this just didn't happen, you know. Um, and when um, you say mentor... 
explain to me too, just and explain to everyone out there, when you say mentor, what it, what does that mean to you? What are they doing for you? And what does that relationship look like? Well, you know, it's not some something that is maintained on a daily basis. It's someone that I feel like I can pick up the phone and if I'm making a decision as a community leader or if I'm making a decision uh, in my business that's a significant Lord Jesus, a uh, decision that, you know, I can bounce an idea off of them. Or I can kind of, if, if I'm even struggling and having a bad day, I know one day Jonathan called me and he was like, and he's a very firm person. Let me just say this. It's like very firm. So he's, he's not a sensitive person by any means. But he was like, you don't sound like yourself today. And it was a day that I was just exhausted, drained, had given everything to everybody, you know, and just kind of felt left with nothing as a leader, you know, and um, and so I began to open up to him and tell him, and like I said, he's not a sensitive person, and he was like, you know I don't do this, but, you know, at the end of the day, he was able to give me wisdom um, in that moment, you know, as a leader and tell me that some days you're going to have this, you know, and, and it was way more detailed, but bad days, major decisions, community decisions, you know, hey, this is what I'm planning to do. They are both past chairs of the African American Chamber of Commerce as well. So that's how that came about. But just being able to call somebody and bounce ideas and thoughts off of, and you know, they're going to see, I don't like people who don't keep it real. Let me say that if, if I'm making a bad decision, say that decision is bad. You know, if, if I'm making a good decision, tell me that if, if you don't know, challenge my thoughts right um, I feel like any leader that if you're making decisions and you're not consulting with people and you don't have people to be devil's advocate then you're in a bad situation right um, and so they are two people that's not going to go with whatever I say you know they're gonna challenge me they're gonna you know uh, say, well, you may not need to do it like that. You may need to do it like this. And so that's what mentorship look like for me is being available. Uh, and I'm not one of those people that call every day, every week or anything like that. But they know that when I do call, then, you know, I've thought through the process in detail and I'm just calling to get the finishing touches. Right. And so that's what mentorship is for me. And they're both older than you. Yes, they are. Okay, mm -hmm. and is that enough or two mentor? I mean, how do how do you, how do you how do you decide? Yeah, this person, it, it's just I guess just like a friend, right? It's yeah. just it's just through trial and error and through experience that you know I I, I like the guidance I'm receiving from this person. Mm -hmm. They're being available to me, and I'm going to keep going back to them if they're if they're so willing. Yeah, and and it's weird because that's how it happened. It wasn't like hey, never picked up the phone and said hey, I want you to be my mentor. Never did. Um, never had that conversation. It's just like after I realized that um, they were feeling a need that I needed, you know, um, then I kept on, you know, in my head, I'm like, hey, who do I call when I need to make major decisions? You know, who do I bounce these things off? They're older, they're wise, you know, they've been through some of the things that I've gone through. And so it just kind of fell into place and then one time I was speaking somewhere and I called them my mentors I was like unofficial because they had officially accepted and, and it just from there I was like yeah they are my mentors you know and so we don't even use that term I'm just going to be honest but they're I I'm a they are available and accessible when I need them and it just works right and and it's important yeah all right, we're going to shift gears for a second. This is going to be a little easier question or, or a little more fun maybe. I don't know. Um, a friend of yours is, is coming to visit. Uh, it'll be his or her first time in Shreveport, Bossier, and he or she is only in town for one full day. Okay. Where all do you go and where do you take him or her to give a sense of Brittany's Shreveport, Bossier? <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, 
Let's see. Well, I would see, you know, what's going on that week for sure. You know, because we do have things that are going on, different festivals and stuff that may come to Shreveport. Uh, definitely we'll go to Orlando. So we were just talking about that when we had some people in town with the Louisiana Chamber Foundation. It's like, you have to take people to Orlando's. Um, better, at, better at lunch or better at dinner? It's funny you're saying this, by the way. Ellen's not laughing, but uh, we've had this conversation in the last couple of weeks of me pushing Ellen and some other people that share an office with me mm-hmm. who have not gone to Orlando's before. You got to go. You got to go. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say dinner. Okay. I would During say, the week or on the weekend? Uh, well, you didn't say when they were coming to town, but let's say on the weekend. Okay. Right? Um, take them to dinner there. Um, you take a note? Yeah, you okay. have to go. Um, I'm trying to see what we would do in the daytime. Ooh, I'll have to think about that. I'm sorry. I'm trying to think. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Let me just be honest, right? My life is so consumed with community stuff. I, I really has, I haven't been doing personal stuff. Like when there are things like... Um, well, let me ask you this. What neighborhood did you grow up in or, or did you grow up here? What neighborhood did you grow up in? What neighborhood do you live in? Mm-hmm. Do you go to church? If so, where? Okay. Um, where's your business located? Those okay. kind of things. So which part of okay, Shreveport okay, Bossier okay. are we, are we seeing? And, and um, I did. I actually am from Minden. Okay. Um, and so um, I currently live in Southern Hills right okay. now. So, of course, you know, if they're over to my house right now, then we'll be uh, in Southern Hills area. Um, I work. My office is located um, on Kings Highway right there by Julianne's. Okay. So we may stop there for a snack. Listen, I love snacks. Okay. Um, so uh, <laughs> we'll definitely go there if we go to my office. Um on the weekends, um, my church, my pastor moved a couple years ago, and so we're virtual. Me and my husband, since COVID, stayed virtual that way and haven't gone out back to uh, a facility or looking for a new church home since he's moved. So, um, but I would, if they want to go to church, I mean, there are options. It's a lot of pastors that I definitely recommend, so I could take them some places. Um, but just overall, um, you know, on Yuri Drive, picking up the kids, um, from daycare i have another child that goes to daycare online avenue um so those are some of the areas that i go to on a daily basis um downtown of course uh if there's something going on at the office hub normally if there's after hours events then i'm at the office hub uh, for some networking events and things like that they can turn into fun um but that's pretty much you know the areas that i travel on a routine basis and what are we what are we eating at orlando's Oh, shrimp and grits. I mean, it's so amazing. It really is. Definitely shrimp and grits. Oh, and then the daiquiri, um, the daiquiri bar. Uh, and Jonathan Reynolds owned that. So, you know, definitely. And where is that? Um, that's on Texas. Okay. Uh, further down Texas. And so, definitely um, weekday, I would say, or a Friday night, we would go and have daiquiris at the daiquiri bar. Good vibe. Uh, TVs there, good music, and um, that's really a hangout spot for a lot of young professionals that are African Americans. So uh, Texas, really, like in the in the heart of downtown Texas, or on no a, further down Texas, okay. um, on the other side of Common. Yes, absolutely. Okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that would be a place that we would go for nightlife. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Mm-hmm. All right. So my next question is: as you look around our community, what concerns you the most? The racial divide, right? Um, That definitely concerns me. You know, we're in a majority African-American city. Let me interrupt one sec. Okay. Because this is, I've been thinking about this. So, Mm -hmm. some whites still refer to blacks as minorities here, Mm -hmm. when in fact, we're we're the minority Mm -hmm. so why like why why is that and why do some african americans still refer to themselves as a minority when in fact they're not and do you have any problem with that it's just it's 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 i'm very aware that's a great question um to be honest i still feel like a minority 
in this city. You know, even though we are a uh, majority, then the opportunities are still limited for us. I'm just being honest, you know. Um, whenever you, and, and that's something that we have to work on. We have to recognize that, and, and I'm not just trying, to, it's some other cities that are majority African American, like Atlanta, um, things like that, but we have to realize that this is a majority black city. And if we do want to make this city better, we have to cut out the racial divide and realize that the African American communities do need help, right? Um, and how are we going to help them as business owners, you know, as citizens, because that's the only way that we can empower empower that group of people uh, so that the city can be the best that it can be. I mean, you don't want a 60% African-American city and 40% of the city is, I want to make sure I be very careful with my words. Um, you don't have to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, you don't want... Um, you know, people, let me just say this, people complain about crime and different things in the African-American areas, right? But we have to create opportunities for those people as well so that we can build them up, so that they can see that they can actually, hey, if I go out and get a felony or if I go out and get, if I do fall into a, a, a bad trap at some point in life, then at some point I can still get a job that will cover my family that are be able to, for me to be able to provide for my family and if not that person may go back into that same cycle of you know doing something illegal in order to provide for their family uh you know we need reasonable paying jobs we need to build african-american businesses help build capacity so that they can hire some of their own people. I mean, one of the things that I always look at is I want somebody who is coming up uh, to say, hey, how did you build your business? How did you get there? What can I do? You know, and so, but everybody doesn't have, didn't come the same path that I did, right? Their path might have been a little bit different, but I can understand that, but I need for other people to understand that, you know? And when I'm in the rooms and we're talking about economic development with all of the powers that be, right? Um, you have different people over different organizations. That's not something that we address, and that's an issue because if we don't improve those commit, uh, communities and, and empower them and... Um, put businesses there or help them grow their businesses, then we're failing ourselves, right? And so um, I just feel like the racial divide people, let, let me give you an example, right? Um, last week was Black Restaurant Week. If you read the comments on KSLA, it was ridiculous. You know, people, why do we need to have a Black Restaurant Week? Well, the reason is because we have African American businesses that are not being patronized. People don't even know where they are. They don't have marketing dollars to be on billboards on Yuri Drive to say, hey, go here. So, you know, we have governmental entities like Cattle Pair or City of Shreveport that has invested dollars to say, hey, these businesses are struggling or have struggled um, even during COVID or struggling even more. I mean, we close businesses every day and we see them close. They, we have disparities, of course, but we don't, these people don't have marketing dollars. People don't know. I I, as an African-American, even with us having Black Restaurant Week, I find out about new businesses that are in areas that I did not know or new restaurants. So it's a way to empower the community and say, hey, we want to support you. Every day, somebody's going to ride down your drive and stop at this restaurant or that restaurant. But you may not go into Cedar Grove and visit, uh, you know, Sally's you know, bakery or something like that. So it's just to say, hey, for this week, let us invest our dollars in this business and empower them and, and help them, you know, and also uh, let people know where they are located so that in hopes that will be marketing for that company or for that business. And the negativity that was surrounding it was, it was hurtful that we And that's coming from the whites or coming from the blacks? From the whites. Okay. And, and so it's like we have to recognize that 
people, certain certain groups of people have certain struggles and then we have to realize identify how we can help them you know and it's not going to be a me 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 thing or why do we have to help them we're helping Shreveport as a whole right uh the more we empower other communities then the better we can do uh, we can grow Shreveport we can the economic development, people can employ other people, you know, we can give people livable wages, you know, and things like that. Amazon doesn't have to come in just for us to be able to employ people. Let's build some of these businesses right here and they can have three, four, five employees as well, you know, but that's things that are always left on the table. You know, it's always the big things that we want to bring to Shreveport, but we need to focus on the community businesses as well. It's interesting as you're talking. I was in a, I'm, I'm doing something at the DA's office right now, and I was participating in it yesterday. And there was someone there that was talking about domestic violence. And um, I don't. There feels like as you're talking, it feels like a connection between what they said and kind of what you're saying a little bit, which is they were explaining that you know for some people, you know, people are very quick to react or to help someone who's been robbed or been been shot or mm-hmm. been raped, um, but there's still a a certain part of the community that thinks you know well domestic violence that's just you know that's inside the home Mm -hmm. and that's a that's a private matter and Mm -hmm. we shouldn't we 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 shouldn't support that Mm -hmm. piece or shouldn't intervene in that aspect and and you know some of it seems similar to it's a tough analogy to draw but between you know that and the african-american community who you know there may be a certain segment of the population who says well you know that's their problem or that Mm -hmm. that." and that's that's exactly what it is but it's a Shreveport problem you know you you say hey I don't want to drive in this area because let let me give you another example right um when we talk about just you know our communities you know it's it's things that can be done like vacant buildings that people sit on in Shreveport that are not owned by people in their own community, right? And and I I recently tried to acquire two properties for my office in the African-American community um, for my business, and people are just sitting on them. They won't sell it to an African-American so that they can build up their own community. It's just sitting there going down, you know? So- um, And why are they, they're sitting on it because they're waiting for a white person to purchase? No, they just don't want to get rid of it right now. One of them told me, hey, I'm using it for storage. And I'm like, but why use a building that's deteriorating in our community for storage when I'm willing to invest in it, right? How how can we fix some of the problems to where when you ride down certain streets, if we have buildings that are deteriorating, that we don't have any control on how we're going to fix them, right? And that's my thought. Yeah, Ellen was actually before you got on. We were talk, She was mentioning two homes on market that mm-hmm. are are falling, are are in bad shape, and um, they're not only or is it happening, um, and it's it's bad just that to think that this is happening to people in our community, but it's also in a very visible part Absolutely. of the community Even where downtown. So, yeah. Yes, yes, people are just holding on to real estate, and it's like, hey, let somebody do something with their real estate so it can, so we can, you know, improve Shreveport. Yeah. Yes. All right. So my final question on a on a on a on on Already sort of, I know, but we can keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got no we got no uh, time time constraints on this. Um, my final question is, what makes you hopeful about the future of this community? As you look around. Oh, well, well, well. Um, I w- let, me, let me rethink that answer. Um, you know, I, I want to say like the last three or four years, I've seen Shreveport progressing, you know. Um, Be, and, and give me some specifics. Like what, what seems better, what seems... Um, to be improving or what seems to be progressing as well I can say that you know as a minority business owner I've seen you know more help and and, and you know city of Shreveport trying to help cattle parish attempting to help minority businesses saying hey what can we do to help these businesses so that makes things hopeful for me for sure um, as a whole um, 
it's some things that I think we still need to work on. But I, I'm going to say just as a, a young professional, um, definitely seeing people who actually respect what you're doing, whether it's uh, African-American, Caucasian, older person, younger person, you know, those things like that uh, make you keep going and, and gives you hope to keep pressing forward to try to move the needle and keep grabbing a hold to other people and saying, hey, we're going to get somewhere if we keep going, you know. So I, I just recently, you know, talked to several different people that didn't even know knew me, didn't even know knew of the things that was going on in the community and the impact. And um, they gave me hope that if I keep pushing, if people who I'm surrounded by keep pushing, then we can change some things in Shreveport. I'm going to be honest. That, that's that been my last burst of hope that I really, really needed at a time. Because, you know, when you invest so much and you invest so much and you kind of seem like you continue to hit a brick wall, right? And, and that's where I was at one time. I felt like I continued to hit a brick wall. I think that when you start having uh, government officials that actually listen, you know, uh, as a leader, I felt like for the last four years, my voice has been heard. You know, I can speak on the behalf of an African-American professional. I can speak on the behalf as a chamber chairperson. And whenever I show up to the table, in the majority of the instances, I actually have a seat at the table. And at one point in time, the decision was made before I got there. You know, and so having a voice to be able to be heard has given me hope. Um, having watching other people who, you know, our colleagues have a voice and they can pick up the phone and call and we can actually have movement on things that gives us hope. Because when I feel like um, a couple of years ago, it was like I was trying to make connections to see like, if, if I need to ask somebody about this resource or if I need to ask somebody about this or if I want to propose this piece of legislation or, you know, I see people who need this, who do I talk to? And I feel like actually maneuvering in different circles and finding out that this person can do this and this person can do this and this person can do this and they actually give you the time of the day and listen. You know, I feel like government officials and um, all of them um, and community leaders, other ones that are older, actually giving some of us that are in that 30 range, uh, you know, under 40 range, giving us an ear to listen and actually making phone calls on our behalf or actually, you know, giving us feedback, even if they can't make the phone call and say, well, you know, may not, but just to know that you have that access and they listen does give me hope. I'm going to be honest because at one time I feel like all of this stuff was in my mind that, you know, we needed to do or we needed to fix and I didn't know who to call or I had to call a friend of a friend of a friend and then they call or I had to call somebody that's over 60 years old because it was old Shreveport and you know, then they have to call somebody that they knew. And so just now being able to have a voice when I show up to the table and being invited to certain tables, then I think gives me hope because I'm going to come in and I'm going to speak on behalf on the whole group of people that I represent. And that that does give me hope and it gives me hope to be able to take back to people and say, hey, they're listening, you know, and so if we can continue that path forward, then I definitely think that we can see some of the gaps in Shreveport be bridged. I would love that. Yes, yes. Well, thanks for being here today. Thanks for being honest yes. and um, for all you're doing. Um, you give me hope. So uh, oh, thanks thank for you. thanks for making the time to share some of what you see with us. Yes, and thank you all for having me. And thank you all for doing this. I mean, just to get other people's perspective out and let people see it. You know, sometimes people don't know what live in someone's mind. You know, they don't know what their... Uh, idea of Shreveport or what struggles they're having or, you know, what value they bring or uh, what work they're doing. So we appreciate you all for even uh, hosting us so that we can be able to tell a story. 
Absolutely. We all got a lot to learn, so hopefully we're just getting started. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you. Absolutely.